Hello, and welcome to GBA 1, Module 1. This week, we will be covering the first two chapters in the course text with an overview of the benefits in Bit, design of benefits programs, and the use of the functional approach in designing and evaluating employee benefits. In covering the learning objectives for Module 1, we will 1. Distinguish between a broad view and more limited view of employee benefits. 2. Explain the evolutionary factors that have resulted in the growth of employee benefits programs. 3. Discuss overall questions that are generally necessary to evaluate benefits and balancing its components. 4. Understand the factors considered in determining eligibility for employee benefit programs and the types of protection provided by them. And 5. Give a brief explanation of the functional approach to benefits administration. To better understand the world of employee benefits, it is important to understand how the term is defined. Benefits can be thought of in terms of a tripod or three-legged stool of economic security, which includes governmental mandated benefits, employer-sponsored benefits, and benefits covered by the individual. While benefits are part of the overall total rewards package, defining them can be done by one of two views, a broad view or a limited view. Both can be helpful in the determination of how best to leverage resources toward design of an employee benefits package. The broad view can be understood as being, quote, virtually any form of compensation other than direct wages and can include the employer's share of governmental legally mandated benefits, payments for time not worked, the employer's share of medical and health related benefits, the employer's share of retirement and savings plans, and any miscellaneous benefit offered by the employer. The limited view can be understood as any type of plan that is sponsored by or initiated unilaterally or jointly by employees and employers. Benefits stemming from the employment relationship and plans that are not underwritten or paid for by the government. Basically, the limited view is the broad view minus the government mandated benefits. The push toward employers adding benefits for employees started to take place after the Industrial Revolution. Why would this be? Well, employees started moving to work for employers in larger metropolitan areas. This aggregation of employee groups made it easier to cover all employees under just one employment type contract or benefits contract. The idea of offering employees benefits through the employer was convenient and simple with this aggregation. Cost effectiveness of providing the benefits via the employers was seen by benefit suppliers and providers to include insurance companies, banks, and healthcare coverage providers. All of them wanted to have a piece of that pie. But nothing is free from governmental influence. Historically, benefits mainly con were consisted of factors of government regulation mandated options such as Social Security. Now the regulations include consideration of such things such as insurance due to the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act passed on March 23rd of 2010. Once thought of as a fringe offering, companies use the addition of benefits to compete for labor as an offset to higher wages. Among major factors that have led us to the current state of employee benefits and the group approach were the influence of World War II and the Korean War. Uh, there was a belief that if the private industry did not take care of providing benefits to employees, the government would get involved, a term known as governmental moral suasion. There was also a wage freezes that were taking place based on government direction, so benefits were one way that companies could continue to compete for labor. Finally, there was the belief that offering benefits on a wide scale would help to reduce the possibility of adverse selection. Of major influence from the collective bargaining arena was the Labor Management Relations Act or the Taft-Hartley Act. This is administered by the NLRB, requiring good faith bargaining between employers and employees in matters of hours, wages, and working conditions. Benefits fall within this requirement. This act has been bolstered by the Internal Revenue Code, which made a distinction between retirement benefits and welfare benefits such as life and health insurance and established a basic regulatory framework in administering these type of benefits under the collective bargaining process. 
Currently, a certain level of benefits is a quote-unquote expectation of the employee base. Benefits may account for over 35% of the employee's total compensation, making them vitally important to consideration when putting together a total rewards package. An evolutionary and innovative approach to these types of offerings of benefits has now become more important to the strategic initiatives of attraction, retention, and motivation of employees. Over the years, there has been growth in the employee benefits plans due to business reasons, collective bargaining, favorable tax legislation, and efficiency of the employee benefits approach. When turning to the functional approach, we can define it as an organized system for classifying and analyzing the risks and needs of those targeted to be insured. The system organizes the participants into logical categories of exposure to risk and employee needs. It was originated in 1967 by a gentleman named George C. Faust. The functional approach serves to help to maintain a sense of order and consistency in a benefits program by avoiding the fads and pressures for different benefits salespersons simply by managing two fundamentals. When determining a benefits plan design, one must first examine the compensation philosophy and must balance all the pieces of it based on the desire to either lead, lag, or match in the market with pay and benefits. There are 12 main considerations in the development of the plan, which include 1. Classifying employee and dependent needs into functional categories. 2. Classifying the categories of people to be covered. 3. Analyzing current benefits in categories of needs and of persons covered. 4. Determining the gaps and overlap in benefits choices. 5. Considering recommendations for changes to cover gaps and overlaps. 6. Estimating the cost or savings from the recommendations. 7. Evaluating alternative methods of financing the benefits. 8. Consideration of the cost saving techniques toward the benefits such as plan design and managed care options. 9. Making decision on benefits, financing methods, and sources of benefits. 10. Make sure the changes are implemented. 11, make sure they're communicated, and then 12, make sure that you periodically evaluate uh, the operationalization and value of those benefits programs. In our next module, we will cover the chapter that covers risks, concepts, and employee benefit planning. On to module two.